So how did you get involved in radio? It wasn't a, a sense of like, oh, thank goodness for drugs. They led well, me in my direction. <laughs> what I'm saying by that is like, if it wasn't for that, yeah, I would have continued to kind of lie to myself. Mike, so uh, thank you for coming on, and thank you for having me, man. Let's take off the hat. All right. Tell me about your hair. What's working and what's not working? I'll be very honest with you. First and foremost, at 44 years old, I'm just so happy I have this much hair. <laughs> like, I have no threat of seeming the knock on invisible wood of, of losing. Me. Yeah. But uh, I have bad cowlicks, bad cowlicks. Yeah. Like, right here right here mm -hmm. so even though i like the idea of you know cleaning it up getting really tight around the sides um i always have to watch out for that because if it was if, honestly if it was up to me like yeah. at ideal world i'd have hair longer than yours i i i always wanted to be like prime david lee roth or like 87 hetfield yeah and like you know I, I dreamed of that lush hair but uh I can't do that because what? honestly, it because once it gets a little bit longer than this, yeah. Because I held off so that I could get yeah. into this podcast. Once you get a little longer, it, it just it's it won't sit down. What's the longest your hair has ever been? Oh gosh, have you ever gotten it to your shoulders or no? No, no, no. I mean, the longest it's ever been would be like earlobe level, okay. oblique, and that was when I was you know thirteen. Okay, dreaming of being you know Kelly Slater. Or at least looking like him. I don't know if I dreamt of being him. And I feel like now with my hair curly, I'm, I'm like right in this line. Like I want to look like Chris Cornell. Yeah. But I'm feeling more like Rob Machado. Like <laughs> the curls. I, I feel like I'm this weird blend of the two. Uh, yeah. Yo, but you know, one thing, for, I, I, was, I don't know, blowing smoke, but yeah. you're definitely not Chad Kroger. Like you're, you're good up back and as a woman. <laughs> <laughs> You've never had your hair long. You're not interested in actually trying to grow it long at this stage of the game. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not disinterested, okay. you know, I just, I, I guess I've become, so it, it's become normalized for me to have almost like military level, uh, short hair that it, it, it almost seems like foreign to me, but I'm, I'm certainly not against it. I like to flex the muscle of the fact that I don't have like standards to live by. I can grow to, yeah, I can get tattoos wherever I want and grow my hair. However the heck I like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, do it. Um, do you okay so when your hair is as you said like military gray short is it is it easier for you just to like it had to live to yeah yeah for sure like, like, for you to exist it's just easier it's like one less thing to think about well yeah because i'm so active and i'm active in uh ways that like oftentimes like there's dudes wrenching on my head and punching me and stuff you know they train a lot what do you train for it, it just in just jujitsu muay thai okay i'm constantly training and then you know like lifting weights and everything and it's nice to be able to, without showering or primping, be able to go and then maybe go on camera and feel fine. That's the upside. But again, like I said, I'm really uh, very open-minded about my hair. If you wanted to do something really classic, I would be totally into that. If you wanted to do something a little bit more edgy, you know, like like uh, early 2000s hardcore kid, I'd be like, yeah, let's go for it. You know, I'm I'm really lucky, A, with the, like, I guess the type of hair I have and then also like my lifestyle um, there's no, it's pretty much like all bets are off, you know, first off, like I'm not into just giving wild haircuts for the sake of doing a wild haircut. Sure. Unless the wild haircut is getting flattering. I'm into doing haircuts that are just going to flatter somebody. Well then what, in your professional opinion, where would you go? Okay. So first off is for me, it's going to be a little bit of like, you get out of the shower. Do you care about like when your hair is wet, do you style it right away? Or is it like one of the first things you think of? Or is it one of the more of the last things you think of? Priority wise, it's one of the first things I think of. But, but I end up pushing it down the line because if I, I've noticed if I style my hair when it's wet, I get really Jersey Shore look at it. Like it's really oily looking. Okay. Even if it's not necessarily that oily or shiny. Yeah. It become it looks that way. Okay. Um, so I always let it get this dry before I style it. Okay. Are you opposed to blow drying your hair or have you? Personally, uh, I can't think of a time when I blue dry my own hair, but certainly like in sitting in makeup rooms and stuff, I've had my hair. Blown, blown it dry many a time. The style is yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And you, have, you actually have really good hair. Well, thank you, dude. Yeah, I mean you got some uh, some silver showing up, but I, I, I couldn't say. believe it. I 
I, I would say I'd rather turn gray and it run away. Figure if you're getting cheap, sure. one of the two, I'll, I'll take gray hair all day. And I know like a lot's made nowadays about like uh, the inequality between men and women, but this is one that's rel pretty much undeniable. Like a woman goes gray or a woman has a hair loss for some reason. Mm -hmm. It's a fucking disaster. Guys, you can be like, I actually think I look sexier. I could have it. It's undistinguished. It? Like, it's really unfair, the, the hair aspect of it. Totally. The one thing I actually wish that would be more normalized is uh, that it's not weird or odd that men want to get hair restoration or yeah. hair transplants. Yeah. And a guy gets a little bit of their hairline replenished and they're like, you're so vain. I think it's changing I, I, because the, the the quality of those surgeries is so much better now. Totally. And also, like, how can you not understand that? I'm not going to be that guy that's going to rub salt in the wound that I, I, I hit genetic lottery when it came to hair. Yeah. As far as hair loss, you know? Yeah. Um, my dad is 78 and he had uh, cancer. Love, thank, by the grace of God, he's okay. But he went through a uh, year and a half of chemotherapy yeah. at, in at like 74. Yeah. Uh, came out of it bald and in like six months had boom, like full, like, Lucky. like Tom Jones hair. So I have those genetics and both my grandfathers died in their nineties with full heads of hair. My point being, how could you not see how that could be really hurtful to like watch your hair go away? Yeah. And if a guy has the opportunity to, to do it, change that, that's why not? Yeah. I wish it would be a more of an open conversation yeah. with a lot of things like we were talking about before we got filming like drug addiction like uh alcoholism like dependence like uh certain forms of abuse the internet has kind of really done a great job of making that less taboo absolutely because you just realize like oh my gosh like mm. i'm not all a lot of people deal with it totally yeah so let's okay so back to your hair yeah we're in the middle of the, the texas sun where it is it's hot it sure is it, it's not it's not 78 degrees in southern california where you and i will uh, are from we're lucky if it even gets to 82 in the evening i actually think it looks nice i've seen i mean i, I definitely know that you've you posted that you've gotten haircuts on your instagram or facebook or something where you feel like had it really short it looks really nice because you actually have like a really yeah and your head's really flat to the sides like it doesn't round and get this light bulbish thing no so it looks good i actually do think going short like that would be nice i think it looks great the, the, now here's the million dollar question on the top. You mentioned something about like an early 2000, like scene kid, right? Yeah. Hardcore kid. But one thing that's also happening in fashion or in hair is also a little bit more of like that late nineties, early 2000, more like messier sort of like you just towel dry, put the product in and get yeah. your calyx because you have these calyx that want to go in every direction you're saying i could work with them as opposed to try to find right. them yeah exactly it's something to think about first guy that i think of who ought who has consistently just had really good hair uh is brad pitt and fight club yeah like that to me is like the pinnacle of like cool short messy and uh you know you're ripped like him too so it would look good I was not going to say that, but I was going to say I could peel off my shirt and at least it's a facsimile of Tyler Durden. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I have my personal trainer, I go, I want to look like the guy from Fight Club. So like, you want to get big, but I go, no, I'm going to get that lean, yeah. but I don't want to get bigger. And they're like, what? Do you have Rob, uh, I think that's the name, Rob Mick Mickle, something from uh, It's Always Sunny, the the muscular gentleman from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, I've never watched it. Well, there's, there's the... Danny DeVito and the other comedian guys, and then one of them's kind of built really well. And he was saying that, like, he went into his trainer and, uh, because he, he actually had to gain weight for part of the role. He had to get, kind of get budgy. Yeah. And he, when he was done with that storyline, he's like, all right, listen, I want, I'm ready to, to do the job and go to work. I really wanted the guy stops him and he says, you want to look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club? I said, every guy yeah. wants that. Yep. You know? We got to realize, like, you actually have the perfect frame. To be that guy, I I was not gifted that way. I was a stockier guy. I I yeah. I, I when it came down to like physiques, I was like I like Brad Pitt in uh, Fight Club or Ryan Gosling and uh, Crazy Stupid, whatever it was. Yeah, like those two, like one of those two physiques, I would I would be okay with. I wonder though, uh, because both those uh, the I think Ryan and Gosling and Brad Pitt in those movies look look great. Uh, but I wonder how much of it is that they're beautiful men. Like, how much do the, does it get elevated? You know, when I hear women say, like, oh, my God, have you ever seen Ren, uh, Ronaldo with his shirt off? And you're like, well, yeah, but 
he's also gorgeous. Like I'm, I'm sure if you put that on a regular guy, and the same thing like goes with. I wonder if Margot Robbie even has a great body. You just, I think your brain sends it there because she's so unbelievably this beautiful thing, it's that just, it just kind of comes at you 95% yeah. with the Brad Pitt and Gossing thing uh, Gossing because uh, complexion and hair color mm -hmm. and physique type like it was a most relatable yeah at the time I used to wear my hair short like like his at that time not because of him but I was like okay his color palette of clothes that work with his skin color again more relatable sure. to me than me picking something with your skin color where like you're more you're darker you're all of course you're like my son my son mm -hmm. my oldest son is he gets sort of my he's a uh, my wife's half Puerto Rican right so okay. I, I, I tell him I have Puerto Ricans for kids <laughs> that's solid yes one totally has the dark skin color and the other one is like as white as me yeah for me it was like one of those things I looked at like I think uh, I wish I had the muscular definition of Brad Pitt but I wish I I think when I looked at Ryan Gosling, I'm like oh his his style of dressing was also relatable I wonder if that comes from your experience in, in in like visual art and then also with cutting hair is like most guys won't do that they'll just see something they like and say like oh i want that never giving any thought to the fact like like if i saw michael fassbender in a suit mm -hmm. that looked a certain way i i could say that looks amazing i can't possibly assume it would look good on me at 5 10 100 200 pounds you know what i'm saying like Whereas, like, you, there there was no consideration for the guy that, that he's really tall and thin, you know. Whereas, like, if I see Tom Hardy, I could go, like, okay, well, yeah, I can do that, you know. You know who actually kind of put that in perspective for me? It was a client of mine back in California, and his name uh, was David Hiley. He owns a company called David August. Mm -hmm. They make all the suits. Yeah, everybody. And so he was saying, he goes, well, the reason I think you like that, he goes, well, look, your frames are more similar built. And he goes, he goes, with more men, he goes, he goes, this is what he does. He tries to find another person he's like if you're going to look at that and i and i was doing it with hair and mm. never thought about it to invent like a whole 360 of a top to bottom yeah and i deal with it too with like personal training a guy will call me you know write me or, or one works and he's like i'm 5'10 uh 230 pounds i really want to lose weight and everything i my my ideal body would be uh brad pitt the fight club i was like listen I'm not trying to discourage you. We can get you to look like a Greek god, you know? Yeah. And, and a, a certain amount, it could be a long time, but we can do that. Yeah. You'll never look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club. He has a teeny waist naturally. He has really broad shoulders and he's six foot four, you know? He's six four. He's tall. I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, projecting because I'm 5'10". And so everyone seems, when I meet people in Hollywood and they're anything over six feet, I'm always like, oh, look at Look at this giant, you know? The only person that really I have met that I was so shocked how tall they were. Leo? Nicolas Cage. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's about 6'3". Yeah, because Leo, Leo, Leo shocked me. He was, he's a tall fella. And I always saw on screen, I always saw him as like a, a very average size. He's a big guy. He's six. He's six two, six three. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't think that. I thought he'd be like 5'10". Yeah. So you wanna, do you want to keep this part long or do you want to kind of keep it shorter? I'd like to go for kind of as long as is reasonable. So let's do something like that. Okay. And then let's see where we got going on here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's what's going on here. So what happens is if you cut your hair completely the same length all the way, like if I tipped your head, mm. it'd be like a straight line. Well, what will happen is because your apex of your head is higher here yeah. than it is here, right? So it makes this part get fluffier and it makes this part look shorter. Has that happened to you? Absolutely. Well, I don't, I, that hasn't happened as much as like when I was high school, you know, you shave your head for football and I just realized like, I have a stupid head. Like yeah. I have a really alien shaped head. Yeah. The other thing too, is you have this calic back here, right? So yeah. they took when, uh, when you got a physical cut, they took it up really high here yeah. in the back. Uh, you can't see that in the camera, but, um, I'm going to propose that you grow some of this out. This will actually help with a really nice transition. So that way when you do slick this back or something, yeah. it'll have a really nice blending point here in the back or if you push it off to the right to the left and uh that's my next question so like if i were to like say hey okay here's your hair move it out of your face okay what do you do uh it was just some stress just move it okay so that's the drift thing moving here all right that's the trick cool okay so if anybody wants to know how to figure out the trick and mess up your client's hair and you say move it and then that's the natural direction without thinking that you move it does it say anything about because they they, they say like the whatever arm you put over when you cross your arms really yeah. it shows different personality types i wonder if there's their coordination yeah I, I don't know i just know that if i mess your hair up and i just watch which hand you move it to 
That makes sense. It tells like yeah. naturally what you feel comfortable. Yeah. Like for me, I always go like this and, and you might like this. So I know that we're going to work with something that's going to work better going to the left. Fantastic. Cool. Let's get this size then shorter because I want to make sure I get that done. So then the top blends in. I'm going to cut that dry. All right. Here. And uh, that hat seems like I've seen some yard work or something. Um, yeah. I have a farm, so everything I own, besides like a handful of suits, yeah, I, but everything, I, it's just covered in like nothing you could do about it, stains. And luckily, I've been, I've found a way to kind of deal with odor, but. Oh, the odor? Yeah. Cause like farm animals, they, I mean, I can't really properly explain how much it's given to me in a positive sense, like the, 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 the relationship you can develop with certain animals and having a variety of animals to try and do it with. It's beautiful. It's amazing, but they're gross. They're so gross. They're such unbelievably gross creatures. Yeah. I have to ask, yeah. why did you and Jason meet? Because that's how Jason put us in contact. Yeah. Um, I mean, how did that all happen? That's a pretty improbable coupling. Yeah, I agree. Um, my ex-wife. Okay. She's from South County and grew up with Jaso. And uh, she just knew that kind of that crew, especially like a lot of the like artsier fellas and a lot of the like that huge like South County early hardcore scene, you know, like yeah. glamcore kind of thing. The whole like 18 AT Vision. Yeah, and for, yeah, exactly. And the first two names that came to my head, those are the dudes she grew up with. And so she got you would introduce me to a handful of them some of them it was like immediate and jason was one of them whereas it's like well i i have to hang out with this fellow much more i was trying to figure out how that all came together i mean it's, it doesn't seem unlikely that jason would run in circles where people where he would meet people who worked in radio yeah you know because of the djs and the club called control you know all that and it's just like um i didn't know did you ever go to control Oh yeah, especially by the time like he was really killing it with control. You know, I was a thirty-eight year old guy, mm -hmm. so it was always a little bit. I, I always was trying to check myself on the douche meter, where I was like, "Am I really gonna go around and and like try to troll for girls at control where they're like?" literally 19 to yeah. 21 you know yeah. so i didn't do it often for my own person but i would go to support him and it was like it's it like really beautiful to see especially when like the dubstep scene was so massive and he's literally getting like diplo and and Trillex to come through his place you know it was oh i remember when they had zet yeah we were in the dj booth and he's like i'm like where are you from I was like i'm from frank or like with this crazy thick german accent and i was like oh shit he's like yeah first time like first time in l.a and uh it was fun it was just like wild yeah it was a cool scene and and so i, I would go just to kind of more be a part of it, but like be supportive it's always cool when there's a cool place and you know the owner like it makes you feel cool you know you know it, it it does make you feel cool but i also think it for me going to that was a little bit more like really excited from like look at your building yeah you you built something like you started something you had a vision you didn't waver on it and I always think about that, like all the people I know personally who've been very successful at something, they just continued with their vision. Yeah. We, my daughter um, is going to a different school out here in Texas. So we're, we're like, I don't know how else to put it, but like the auditioning process of visiting the other school, the many new schools that it could potentially be. Mm -hmm. And we just went to one uh, and the lady said, we try to instill many, you know, there's a, there's a foundational collection of characteristics that we want to develop in students and it, you know it was of course it was like the classics in discipline or like self-worth and but she also said perseverance and she said in our opinion that's the most important thing a human can have when it comes to success because everybody fails and you have a dream and you work hard and you you, you put your mind to something and you know chances are it's not going to go your way Mm -hmm. And most people are going to not get back on that horse because it sucks. It really sucks. I agree. I, there's a phrase that uh, when I'm teaching hair, kind of, I'm always saying, and I, and I write it on as like a, a giant post-it note to remind, there's all these quotes. And one of my favorite ones is um, persistency gets you there, mm -hmm. but consistency keeps you there. Yeah. And for me, that's just like a mantra up of life. It's the whole reason why I think everyone fails on, you know, January 25th, 
of their diet and their their gym yeah is they they were they um they were persistent but they were not consistent i think when so many people look back at what where the the failure started it was the um consistency part because it's not easy to to be on it to work to be at that level all the time it's not and i i I think another thing is that it's also not kind of like exciting nope like the idea of just consistently doing fundamental things over and over again it loses its luster and i also think that's why like a lot of like the fitness movements you see because of instagram and youtube it's what is easy to what what can look cool when you make reels and clips out of it whereas in reality if you wanted to have the body of your dreams or performance of your it's probably just endless amounts of doing not very exciting things. And people don't like it. <laughs> no. Especially in a world of visual stimulation. Yeah. You know. You, okay, so I know of you mm-hmm. from Kevin and Beat, mm-hmm. which was the morning program on K-Walk. I, was it ever syndicated out of LA? Just in San Francisco. I just, it was never one of those kind of like linchpin syndicated shows. Okay, it should have. I agree as far as quality, but they and K Rock management at the time, back when the day when K Rock was really owned, like a like kind of a mom and pop entity before mm-hmm. these big conglomerates came through, they they liked the idea of it being local, and they also loved the idea of going back to like the seventies, like Rodney Bingenheimer and uh-huh. the early kind of punk rock new wave world, where it was just for LA, but you heard about the guys trading tapes in Jamaica, trading tapes in London and, you know, hearing Depeche mode in a different country for the first time on this like LA station, you know, gave it this panache, you know? So I think David Buffy was like, uh, was play on Ronnie and being the first time he's ever played on the West coast yet was uh, Ronnie being And uh, like, there's a, there's a, so many bands like that. And it's just not that way. That's something that you lose out with, you know, large entertainment corporations buying up things is that you lose out on that local flavor there you know ZZ Top was it was were rock stars out here years before anybody ever heard of them outside of Texas and the doors the doors were rock stars before people had national knowledge of the doors or you know there's millions of you know the remote how like how important were the Ramones in New York City before they got like national exposure? I, I think you lose out on that with when everything's kind of so ubiquitous now, you know? not just music. So how did you get involved in radio? I mean, I was that something you always wanted to do? Was entertainment something that was always because so far everything we've talked about before we started recording and since we started recording is about fitness. You know, here you mentioned when you shave your head with football. Yeah, I mean. Everything is fitness and and lifestyle. So where's the where's the jump from like my cafe where <laughs> high school football shaved head yeah. to singing "Hey There Vagina" on Kevin and Bean, which I, I thought was hysterical. Okay, my roommate at the time, the manager of Play White Tees. Yeah, oh, yeah. So it, it, he's a like, dude. Keith, have you heard this? Man? That is hysterical. You know, I, honestly, it, it's drugs. I I, mean, I hate to sound like trite or dismiss it. it's yeah so that so drugs went from like you got in drugs and then this whole thing came out of that and it wasn't as a sense of like thank goodness for drugs they led well, me that's, in my direction that's, that's, what i'm saying by that is like if it wasn't for that yeah i would have continued to kind of lie to myself because i grew up in a really even though i grew up in like a really diverse neighborhood i grew up in a really kind of traditional place like a very pedestrian lifestyle where uh what do you do you play sports what do you do you try to try to like go for the cheerleader you you know what i'm saying like and go to school go to college get a business degree that was it wasn't even open for debate for me in my my eyes i had a very kind of forgettable introduction it wasn't as if i was this um uh really edgy kid that was like blowing lines of meth at in eighth grade I was it started like anyone else you know breaking in mom and cat, dad's liquor cabinet and you know, going away to, to your buddy's house on the weekend and his parents were away and we would sneak sneak beers in and it kind of progressed to the point that like I finally came to realize like that what I really wanted to do in life yeah was be creative 
Um, and I was always a, I was always that kid who like, I always was painting and, and got really into graffiti art when that was a thing, you know, in the early nineties. Yeah. And animation too. And animation, I, I, I was always above and beyond watching cartoons. I wanted to understand how you could create worlds with, you know, it, it was always fascinating to me. You get to be 21, 22 years old and I'm like a desperate drug addict and all the things that I assumed I was going to do in life had really either gone by the wayside or I was going to have to restart and take a decade to do it. Finally got clean, hopefully for good. Uh, I was 22 years old and I moved back to LA. I was living on the East Coast and I got a job at K-Rock amongst other jobs just as a straight gig, just to pay the bills Mm -hmm. because I thought it would be more fun than sweeping floors somewhere else. You're just sleeping the floors at K-Rock. Yeah, I did. I had you driving the jocks around and just like, I was essentially like a glorified custodian. And, and I'm assuming jocks singing the DJs. Yeah, yeah the disc jockey. Not right. actual like, actual let it. No, 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 yes, no. I, I just make you sorry. Sure. No, it's fine. industry jargon. Uh, I'm asking, because I was like, I was like, jocks. And, uh, oh, jocks. Yeah, Jed the Fish would have to go see Blur at the Wiltshire, at the Wiltshire, and I'd have to, I'd get in a car company car and take them there i started like you know prank calling the morning show and just doing stuff around the station at that point in my life i didn't have any choice but to just like really lean into being myself i didn't i didn't hold any pretension of trying to please anybody and what i wanted to do was to bust bust balls it's what i always love doing and think of like silly things to pass the time and uh they, they put me on the radio. How did that come about? Like, what was it? They just like, hey, Mike, you're always busting every, everybody's balls here in yeah. the studio. You're funny. You have a good voice for for radio. I don't, though. You, I mean, I, I thank you. I think you do. I think you do. I think, I, because I think the classic radio tone voice was like the Rick D's. Well, like, you right? have a really good voice. I think I have a horrible voice. I, I, I cannot stand my really? voice. Yeah, absolutely. I think most people feel that way. So, I'm like, like yeah. You know, you have a good voice, and I, but I, what I mean by like the Rick D's voice is like it always used to be this like very deep, overly barot- baritone, like, like yeah, it seemed disingenuous too. It did, but I think there's it's not so much actually as pitch as I think it's tone. Yeah, like the singer for Rush, Geedy Lee, and the singer for Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan, and the singer for Coheed and Cambria, all have a high range, right? But there's something about the tone. That somebody either likes or dislikes about each one of those. No, that's true, especially with with front men or front women. Like that's the thing. Is like so many of the best ones are not necessarily the best singers. Oh, it's just saying there's something relatable. But I always people talk about Nirvana as like this landmark thing, and it, it absolutely was. It was it. One, what you're saying, this haircut could go horribly. No, wrong. no, no, no. I mean, this mess with it. I mean, but but, but uh, I think one of the overlooked components of why Nirvana was so important people immediately go to the songwriting and and butch Vig's production on nevermind and you go okay yeah absolutely true but like how can no one talk about kurt's voice like he sounded at times like he was gargling glass when he would scream but that it was so kind of beautiful at times and like you know paul and rich you know his voice to me he did something that um i'm drawing the blank but the singer of the who uh robert robert Daltrey. Oh. Is like Robert Daltrey when he would really he could be able to like sing and his voice would distort and it was like he was screaming in an actual key. Yeah, um, Kurt did that beautifully. Chester did that. Chester did that. Chester did that. But Chester is also like a genuinely good singer. Yeah. You know? Oh, he's a great singer. But to do that, to get that raspiness, it's, it's not a it's not an easy thing. Chris Cornell could do it. Mm. It's like almost like his voice would just just distort. Yeah, but it would still be clean. And uh, but it was back to your voice. Like I, you have a very pleasing voice to hear on radio. And I always would listen to K Rock and be like, oh yeah. Like it, I used to love it when uh, Ralph Garman would be on. Yeah, and when you would go on there, it was great. <laughs> and Kevin and Dean were just doing their their, their silly stuff. And uh, so I was always curious, like, how does one get into that? Especially like that, because to me, growing up in Southern California, it was like you had KLOS, yeah, and you had K Rock, yeah. It was like, do you want to listen to what's going on right now, or do you want to listen to a classic? Parent yeah. who with? It's true. As far as rock music, that was the, those were the the heavy hitters, and you know that yeah, it, it, this is a it, one of those like if you put it in a script, it would be too much. 
stories. So I'm at, I'm at the station, just like I said, sweeping floors, driving around the, uh, the DJs and doing that thing. And I start to become known by like the Kevin and beans of the world. And kids are telling Kevin and bean and, and the producers of the show, like, Oh, this guy, you know, stole a mic flag, you know, the little things you put on the microphones that say like K rocker NBC and, and goes to red carpets and, and shits on celebrities. Like he's, there's something there. You could use him in some way. I remember when that, cause you'd go and like interview these, these people on the yeah. carpets and sort of just kind of take the piss out of them. Yeah. It was great. I thought so. I mean, I, so did I. I, I mean, I thought because also I just, I don't think people realize like how appealing it is to not take yourself that seriously. Mm -hmm. And so many of these celebrities would just get so upset and you realize like you watch like the George Clooney, uh, uh, certainly like once I had elevated to the point where I could get to the front of the red carpet as opposed to the back of the red Yeah. But I was working for entertainment tonight. I was working for Access Hollywood farther down the line. You realize like the the Tom Hanks, the George Clooney's, uh, they the Jeff Bridges, they all have a good sense of humor about themselves as opposed to some of the ones that fall by the wayside where you like you realize you are a root, like really you're not hearing answer. You're an entertainer and that's super important. But we can also laugh at like how crazy it is that we're gathering up in a cavalcade in a long line. Yeah. Like, like, like going to the slaughter and asking questions about the clothes you're wearing. Like, this is crazy. Is the average person who's watching this at home going to be able to afford like, you know, Louboutins and uh, Dolce Gabbana, yeah. you know, elite underwear. I mean, it's very strange. It's a very strange thing. It's funny you mentioned Tom Hanks. I had a buddy from high school who worked at the uh, the Arclight. You remember the Arclight? Yeah. Cool theater. And uh, and he was like one of the managers up there because I was going to school. And Tom Hanks was there to see a movie or something like that. And he had to help them escape, like through like a fire exit and all that. And when they got to, it was just like, all right, here you are, sort of thing. He thanked them. Um, and, and my friend was like, you know, uh, Tom Hanks, right? He goes, yeah, he goes, I've loved you. I loved you in The Bachelor. What have you been doing since then? And, and then, and Tom Hanks just like busted up laughing. He's like, I like you. And then like said, thanks. I'm like, laugh. It's silly that I used to, you know, you catch them off guard. And that's what I loved about the thing that you would do is you catch these celebrities that are like so serious well and also you you realize really quickly if they had the opportunity they'd probably make fun of this too like this is crazy what yeah. i'm doing right now like what, <laughs> what is happening right now is crazy like i'm looking at lady gaga in a meat dress you were there for that uh i was i did not get a chance to talk to the young lady that day but i think that was the like grammys probably like i don't know 10 years ago 12 years ago at the time i was i was getting tape for accent uh entertainment site and we were doing that while you're on Kevin and Beat. Yeah. And they were genuinely like, con like they were upset that I couldn't get this in-depth interview with <laughs> Lady Gaga. I was like, wait, wait, wait. I'm upset I didn't get a chance to bust her chop. So like, she's wearing meat. Like, this is insane. You know, like the whole, the whole thing is insane. But I was like at the station, right? I'm doing the thing and I'm just trying to organically bust chops. I mean, I genuinely didn't have any larger aspirations because I, I at that time in my life, I, I thought it was like Dave, the King of Mexico, who was a producer on the Kevin and Bean show. He says, you're like uh, happy Gilmore because as things would unfold for me in broadcasting, I still always I was like, well, no, I'm going to be a musician. I'm a musician. That's what I want to do. You know, you want to be a what? A musician. Really? Like, that's, yo, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. I do. What do you want? I play bass and I play guitar and I write songs and I enjoy it. I mean, that's where like that aspect of my life, you know, with Hey There Vagina and all the different parody songs that had very subtle success. That was, that's where, it, that's where it come from. And, and it was, uh, it was very genuine, but I also, again, like it was like a reverse engineering of something like, of course, if I was, you know, if I was Ben in Death Cab for Cutie and I wrote, I will follow you into the dark, I would take that very seriously. When I had the ability to go home and take that song and make it, I will follow you after you fart. It gave me the opportunity to just like, well, let's, let's piss on this, you know, like yeah. I have to, that was always like a, like a real, for me, like an emotional gift having that, uh, that opportunity. So it was never this like, um, 
you know, I, I've been, I started watching the Arnold series. Yeah. You know, and he talks about how he had the photos, bodybuilders. Have you seen it, by the way? I have, yeah. You know, he has, I'm only on episode one. So, you know, don't spoil it. No, no, no. I don't, I want to know where he ends in his career. Yeah. I don't want to spoil anything, but he ends up becoming a big star. I'm sure. sorry. <laughs> um, but he talks about how he has all these, yeah. these, these, these images, these, you know, bodybuilders and how he wants to be them. And how he had envisioned this, you know, he's like 16, about like 19. Mm -hmm. I think 20 is like what, Mr. Universe, 19 is Mr. Universe yeah. in London. You didn't have any of those like manifest, like I'm going to do this. No, and for a long time, I, 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 I felt like I was doing something wrong or that I was like a fraud. Like Seacrest was that guy. Seacrest genuinely wanted to be Rick Dees or Casey Kasem when he was a little kid. And he just followed his dream and, and worked really hard and became that guy. And so really, really admirable, really impressive. I like radio. I like, especially like more of the off color morning shows. Mm -hmm. um, but I never, I never had like aspirations to be a broadcaster. It just kind of came and I was at a really, really dark point in my life. I was just sober and I was really committed to it this time because I'd certainly made a lot of vain attempts in the past that just didn't work out. Yeah, but I really wanted it. I really wanted to get clean, and I was back home. You're working at K Rock. Yeah, you're 22. Yeah, living with your parents, go to a bunch of meetings. You know, mm -hmm. like yeah. Are you going A A N A? Both, both. Yeah. I mean, everyone says like you think you hit rock bottom until you hit rock bottom. Yeah. Well, mine was really weird because I I think I again this is like I always felt like inadequate because I didn't have this like Hollywood story. I had overdosed a lot when I was living on the East coast. I had overdosed a lot. I had gone to jail. What was your uh, drug of choice? I was a stimulant guy. I loved it. And so we're talking like uh, meth, meth and Coke. I either or I was, I was said not, I was not picky, but I also, when I moved to the East coast, this is like late nineties. Um, meth was quite abundant in Southern California, but it wasn't really that, big in the east coast and so i got into smoking speedballs because i oh, i didn't really like i didn't really like opiates by themselves i would do them it was better than being sober but i i didn't like it you know i was really lucky i think in that regard because uh i think it's a lot harder sometimes physically to get off of opiate based stuff but i would mix heroin and coke and smoke it all day and i was like this is the greatest thing that's ever happened which is how John Belushi died. And that's how a lot of people died. But certainly, this is above my pay grade, but you're getting a lot of conflicting signals here in terms of You're mixing fun. Yeah. In, in, in like the, the most uh, high school equivalent of thing I could think of in biology is you're mixing an acid and a base. Yeah. And you're going, let's inject it. Let's smoke it. What could go wrong? I would overdose a lot. Like I would wake up either with the paramedics like showing up to wherever I was or like legitimately in in ambulances yeah it was horrible and i did that and i got really dark and i had no friends and i had no kind of romantic uh you know interests in from from the from the ladies and my parents had certainly just given up hope i think it's by that point and I, I had nothing going for me and none of that really seemed to motivate me but i was back in la uh the summer before i moved back home for good yeah. and i was in uh in a steamy nasty motel in inglewood smoking rocks like by myself smoking rocks and i remember it was daytime early afternoon and jenny jones was on tv you know like the talk show jenny jones i'm gonna get your eyebrows in your nose real quick no problem yeah so you got some stuff coming i got a lot of got a lot of nose hair man it's the one thing that's uh you can you can do relatively easy. I know, but my mother in law was nice enough to buy me a nose hair trimmer. But I think like it wasn't like a yeah. Uh, tickles. Dope. <laughs> <laughs> I like fight. Do that again. Do that again. With your pull your lip down like that. Oh uh, yeah. Cloth. <laughs> All right. Diggle so much. I feel like for some reason this is like worse than you getting tattooed. Oh yeah. Right. Although I've never gotten it, I've never got tattoos in like what are considered like the super painful areas. I was smoking rocks at this motel, yeah, and by myself. And for some reason there was a there was a mirror at the end of the bed, just like this, okay. where 
if I would, I would look at the TV to the left. And then if I turn straight forward, I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was like shirtless at 11 AM on a weekday doing nothing but smoking rocks by myself in this like super dark with the curtains pulled hotel room. And I genuinely had this feeling of what am I doing? Like, what have I done to myself? And from here on out, I can't, I can't remember this in the first person. I can't remember it looking through my own eyes. I can only see it almost like staring down on myself, like a closed circuit, like an out of body. Yeah. Like, like I genuinely felt like I can't remember this being something that happened to me or just something that I experienced. It's something that happened to me as I was like pulled away. And I know that sounds corny as hell when we're talking about like, you know, the coming to God moment or the, the, the rock bottom, but I just can't remember it. It, like in my own eyes at all but i walked across the room this is 2002 okay so i walk across the room and there's no you know i got run i had no smartphone no google no anything i walked across the room and looked in the drawer for the yellow pages and i started calling addiction treatment centers and i found out and i found one that had a bed and uh i called my parents the next call was to my parents and i told them that i found this place and where I was, and they said, okay, give us a couple hours. We'll be out there to get you. And that was it. And that was the last time I drank or used drugs. You're lucky. I know. You're lucky you, knew that you didn't have the relapse. Oh, I did the, the four times before I tried to get clean. Well, I'm saying it's like people have those rock bottom moments. Yeah. And then they relapse again or something stressful comes up. Yeah. Or, or the, the, the boredom of normalcy. Um, like with the realization of, oh, this is my life. Dude, you hit the nail on the head because so many people in the last 22 years, 21 years, so many people have asked me like, how did you go backstage at all the shows? How did you go to these parties and blah, blah, blah? How, wasn't it hard to deal with? And I was like, no. I was like, you know what was hard to deal with? Friday night by myself watching cable, sitting on the couch. And I was like, you know, an 18 back would make this a lot more fun. <laughs> Like, or, you know, like a couple lines could make this genuinely interesting. The doldrum feelings of like normal life. 20 years of cutting hair. Yeah. I have, I've had everybody sure. much sit in my chair and I had this one lady, her and her husband, they ran a series of treatment centers for women only. Mm. They said that women statistically are the last to ask for help. They said, believe it or not, men. Like, yeah. They said men are the first ones that say, I have a problem, help me. It, which is un with, with, with drugs and alcohol. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, because it, it's totally opposite in pretty much every, every other way. Yeah, yeah. And I was so like, what? And they, and they, and I had an instance where I had a, a, a girlfriend and she uh, went a little crazy. I, I'm going to say that nicely. And uh, I was able to get a restraining order against her. Nice. Um, but I was talking. She was probably so on it. <laughs> Maybe. And she, after I got the restraining order, yeah. every time I turned on uh, MTV2, because at the time they were only playing music videos, mm -hmm. there was like these music videos that she was in. Yeah. And I was like screaming at the TV, like, just get out of my house. Yeah, so foot, you leave here. me. Yeah. You're like a ghost. Yeah. I'm like, get out. I'm on to me. Yeah. Seriously. It, it was, uh, it was kind of funny uh, in retrospect at the time. Not funny. Yeah. But she was saying that she goes, you know, you, she's like, What's probably happening is that because you're quite of a stable individual, mm. they're, they're they're longing for the stability. Yeah, but when they get it, they get bored. Yeah, what, because they're so used to this chaotic up and down, so they're not able to be addicted to the chaos. They're addicted to the high that comes with it, for sure, and then the low that comes down. So I mean, I remember living my life, especially and, at that at the end. Yeah, New York City in two thousand two thousand one. My, it was like being in a video game. It wasn't like really living normal life. Every every hour was a new, uh, like, how can I get more drugs? How can I survive this immediate danger? How how am I going to get from, uh, how am I going to get over the George Washington Bridge? I don't have a car. Uh, I'm going to go talk to this perfect stranger in a really bad neighborhood. Like, everything was like playing Red Dead Redemption, you know, where there's just like these, series of exciting adventures oftentimes really dangerous really scary but and being 44 and a dad now is like my life is devoid of any excitement and that that kind of yeah, yeah excitement, that, you know yeah and I, I just i just wonder sometimes like if 
you know, if it's, you know, that, that addiction to the high, high to the low, low, mm -hmm. I think with, it seems with some addicts, yep. it was just as exciting. Well, it's like hot. It, it, it feels that way from somebody who's never suffered yeah. from this. It's, it becomes much more comfortable. Okay. So because you're just so accustomed to dealing with that level of depression and that level of like self-hatred and mm -hmm. that you, it becomes your new normal. You know, it's like, it, 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 there's so many different forms of kind of human suffering that are that way. I, like every girl I would talk to who was a victim of domestic abuse on Loveline, yeah. uh, that was like the common theme. It's like, well, yeah, but he's, he loves me. And like, but it's just, it's, I'm not going to rock the boat. And you're like, no, no, he punched you in the fucking head. Yeah. Are, do you understand how crazy this is? I'm glad you brought up Loveline. Yeah. So you go, I mean, it's like, oh, wait, so let me get back to it. Okay. So um, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm working at the station and, and, and Kevin and Bean hear this and they're like, well, we have this uh, uh, executive uh, a, assistant producer that's leaving the show. Who do we need to replace him? Just kind of came at the same time. Okay. So they're interviewing a bunch of people and they interview me. They hate me. Who hates you? All of them. Everyone, everyone that works at the Kevin and Me show hates me. Even Kevin and Bean. Yeah, they're like, "Fuck this guy." Yeah, because they're like, "Because look, again, I'm I'm trying to put my life back together. I have this insane opportunity. I grew up listening to these guys. Yeah, I no, I realize now the mistake I was making. But I went in there like I was interviewing to be a CPA at a giant firm. I was wearing a tie. I was like, "Yes, sir. No, sir." You know, when I met everybody, I was like, "Yeah, really." very formal and very starching thinking like I'm presenting my idea of what a good employee would be. Yeah. And they're like, this guy's out for money. This guy sucks. I hate being around him, you know? And they, they were not going to hire me, but they hired Sunday guy. Okay. Yes. Day one comes when he's supposed to get, you got him. We're live five 30 in the morning. Yeah. And I usually got to get in there about five. So day one comes, they hired this dude and he calls in hammer. He's like, I'm not going to make it, man. Uh, I just, I'll be in tomorrow. I, just, I had a long night and Kevin was, I was not there, but Kevin, from what I understand, just fucking like in Goodfellas, when De Niro finds out that Pacino gets killed and he just smashes the phone receiver out of the, he just smashes the phone down and he's like, just fucking hire that other kid. Cause they knew I, I already worked at K-Rock. So like, yeah, at least I was nearby and there was, and that's how I got rich. <laughs> in the months after just getting clean too, like the, 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 the kind of the kismet nature of like a, a guy shitting the bed by, by drinking and using, uh, it's not something that was lost on me, but I, I, like I said, that's one of those stories. Like if you wrote that in a script for a, like a, like a, a family, um, like a, like a Fox family show or a Hallmark show, they'd be like, okay, come on. That's a little over. That but it happen. Yeah. It is. Reality is stranger than the fiction sometimes. Most of the time. Yeah. And I'm, I'm with you on that one. You're on the Kevin and Bean show mm -hmm. for, I was with Kevin and Bean for about a de almost exactly a decade, and then I uh, Carolla left to do his own morning show. He left Loveline to do his own morning show, and then um, and I put in my put my hat in the ring to to be the new host, and, and it ended up being that way. Do you think your your past with recovery and all and of those natures made you a a little bit more of a desirable candidate? considering the nature of the show love yeah absolutely and i really wanted to lean into that because i i knew going in and i told the program director and i told the people who own the syndication for love line i was like look you're gonna get joel McHale and olivia munn and all you know like these tv brock and and that's gonna look a lot better and you're gonna sell a lot more syndication when you take this to the trades and stuff like that but i'm a series of mistakes and that's all I have to offer. You're going to find people who are probably more talented. You're going to find people who are probably more charismatic or easy to market. I was like, I am a, a litany and a collection of mistakes that has gotten me to this point. And all, that's all I have to offer. And I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I, I at least can give you that when I'm going to be on the air and some kid's going to call up about snorting meth or some dude's going to call up about cheating on his girlfriend. It's like, I can be that lifeguard to get, guide them through the the deep waters when I, I just don't know if you're going to find that anywhere else. And that was, that was, that was what I saw myself. At. My favorite part is I used to listen to it with Crowley. Like Crowley was just hysterical. He's so funny. Un so freakishly witty. It's so, yeah. that's amazing. 
and he's one of those people like you know clever witty yeah people but i do remember that the, the tone changed as a listener i'm saying this because i can actually tell you is how great it was to hear somebody who was able to be funny and was able to in some cases like they'll get through to the common person a little bit easier thank you man because you had done that when my friends and i who are hairdressers will like do hairdresser things right you have the one who's like super schooled and very technical and very precise and you know, the other person who has gotten there but maybe not as school a bit more self-taught right they discover their their passion or their technique through their own you know, their own path i used to joke around like oh it's the love line thing and we never would use adam corolla we would always use you as the example like, we're like the drew and cycle like man i liked that because it did for me as somebody who has known people who suffered from this uh from from you know addiction and all those things it was like, oh, look, I've done all this shit. There's like, there's still hope and time left. That's a phenomenal tell and twist and turn of events. No, I don't want to say I had aspirations because I didn't. I, I, to me, being the guy that like the concessions due to Dodger Stadium mm -hmm. looks at me as a celebrity, that was all I ever wanted. I never dreamed of like being a, a big star. I, was, I have no, in fact, I still would get. I have no desire to be like an internationally known big star. It didn't hurt when you were on the uh, Ke with Kelly Ripa. It didn't, but like I think what oh, the only the only reason people liked me being on what affiliate for Regis was because I was like, this is crazy. I'm sitting next to Kelly Ripa, like any other regular dude would be, you know, like, yeah, the, like, like the guy like, who's cleaning the hallway behind the studio would be like, this is bizarre like i'm talking in front of a, per a group of perfect strangers mostly women who are going Woo! whistling at me and i'm wearing a suit and i'm talking to kelly ripa about my feet smelling you know this is this is <laughs> this is fucking preposterous you know yeah and there was never like this polished presentation because i was like this is insane right now what is happening is you understand that right kelly do you understand i i i burned my butt lighting a fart on fire and that is why I'm sitting sideways. Uh, and and she found that very appealing. There's a certain authenticity of realism that I think people crave. And when you put somebody who's not so so uh, overly rigid or like overly thinking about those things, you kind of get of like there's this relatability factor. Like yeah, fun. Like oh wow, like he he does those things as well in any form of entertainment. Like it's been, you see it a lot in metal. Okay, more so than any other, um, uh, maybe like in in the early 2000s or mid 2000s with emo, you'd see it too, where you, you hear like you hear dashboard and you listen to it and you're, well, even if you're not into like more sensitive music, you're like, well, this guy's putting his heart, like he's just absolutely, yeah, just, just bleeding out into, into the world with his music. Then you hear other bands or other artists and you're like, well, I, I think this is pretty contrived. I think this guy wants to write pop songs and then realize he could make a living wearing eyeliner and a cardigan, you know? And in the authenticity, it just doesn't shine through with some people. And sometimes it, it becomes very appealing. I always give the uh, example of like, like Ellen's career is over. Yeah. From what? Because she's not a nice girl. She, that's it. That's it. That was like, people are reporting all over the place. Like Ellen was kind of mean to me. Why? Because she sold for 20 years. She sold this idea that like, she's your best friend and she's really good at it. She's really good at it. Oh, yeah. She could just shine through the camera and be like, you housewife, you regular dude, I, I'm your buddy and I want to dance with you, you know, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be fraudulent. David Letterman fucked his 21 year old intern and, and the next night went on the air. He's like, yeah, so, uh, this is unfortunate. And, uh, I hope we can move past it. And uh, tonight's guest, Pam Anderson, and, and no one ever mentioned it, another thing about never, because David Letterman never pretended to be everybody's lifter. David Letterman's like, I'm a curmudgeon. I hate this. I hate this studio. I hate everyone I work with. Uh, as soon as he shows over, I'm going to my office. Don't knock on that door. I think that some of the guests also didn't know they were getting made fun of until they saw it later, which I love. The only person I know who I, I who would do these jokes, and is, I don't know, you've probably met him because he was probably a K Rock who would make these jokes that would go over most everybody's heads, was Marilyn Manson. Yeah. Super intelligent, super smart, a much smarter guy than people give credit for. Yeah. It was 2001. I was in the dressing room with Slipknot at the Ozfest, and Manson's there. 
and Mansa is just making these jokes. And I'm like, first off, 15 year old version, 15 year old year of me, I'm like 19, right? 2001, 19. So four years earlier, I'm thinking, I'm so like, what the fuck am I doing here? This is yeah. insane. And then the second thing is I'm laughing my ass off because all of my favorite comedy is this dry, intellectual yeah. shit. And all he keeps doing is making one thing and nobody gets it. And once he realizes nobody gets it, he's driving it harder. And he's now just having fun. And it reminded me of what David Letterman would do. They run, it's just like, he's having, he's having his own comedy experience. Yeah. Completely set before. It's like Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like inception versus of comedy. It is. I always appreciated that too. And I, I, I was not by any means uh, friends with Norm MacDonald, but I was friendly from, you know, just getting to know him from being on the show or you know, meeting him here or there, doing my friend's show. And first off, he's the funny, one of the funniest people that's ever lived. But on top of that, he was one of the smartest people ever in the entertainment industry. But he always worked so hard to make it seem like he was not. And I respected the shit out of that because like most smart, genuinely intellectual people that are in entertainment do nothing but try to let you know. They do nothing. They never cease to try to te- it, it just imprint that in your brain like oh by the way i i went to an ivy league school and my iq is one for like norm mcdonald was sitting on this 160 iq and just would be like yeah so uh you know yeah. track whores and uh <laughs> and it, but he was just kind of like letting that 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 nuclear level bomb fester inside of him and he had no desire to like show off was he really a 160 i'm just uh, throwing out numbers but i mean he always just seemed like you like and especially like when you hear him off the air talk to dr drew and you'd be like, where the fuck are you pulling this shit out of? Like, sit, like genuinely high level scientific stuff. He's like, so I was thinking, uh, doctor, you know, uh, and they just, just rifle shit off casually. I'm like, whoa, wow, this guy like puts effort into, he has a genuine intellectual curiosity. So the curiosity or the search of curiosity is any, like, we need to find, we need to be curious again. Yeah. But like, nobody's curious about anything. Like, Eddie Izzer has an amazing skit about Wikipedia. Yeah. Where he's like, you know, how does Jam made? Oh, well, it's like, he's like, before Wikipedia, you had to ask somebody, Steve, how's Jam made? Mike, how's Jam made? I don't know. Well, you had to ask, and you had to, you know, there's this search for stuff, right? And he goes, now you, you know, you have Wikipedia, and you go, and he goes, ah, Jam's created in 1742 by Mrs. Jam. And then Jam, and then you click on all these links, and it takes you to something else that you didn't intend it. And so then we're done with it. And then you're done with it. And then my wife, I was, I was laughing about this time, and my wife, my wife's like, well, there's this whole book about like the the part of your brain that is critical thinking is now because of technologies shrinking it's like becoming atrophy yeah and our curiosity and our way to determine what's going on is shrinking because now we have we don't have to think we just get the information and also like not only like just information but just like experientially well i was thinking about it the other day yeah my daughter she's nine so it's not like it, it's not a big problem yet but <laughs> she she had a song that like she wanted to do her she does like um aerial dancing you know with like the 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 silky stuff that came from the sea yeah. and uh she had a performance and she had to pick a song to dance to right and so she's like papa i was thinking of this song fill in the blank is like some r&b pop song and it was actually a good song but it was like just you know radio hit yeah and uh i go okay well uh what is it and she tells me the title and i immediately go to the streaming service and it's just immediately there and then she's like okay that's it and she goes into her room and that's the end of it if i was watching Beavis and butthead and saw something that caught my eye you know some music video i had to figure out how they're gonna get the money then get on a bike write it to sam goody or the warehouse or yeah. whatever then talk to someone interact with someone up who also has a passion for music yep then buy this physical thing that I would take home to a place where I could play it, yeah. open up the booklet, read about the artist who drew this or you know, just the photography. Yeah. Find out who played bass and who played drums and, and uh, get the track listings, maybe even lyrics. And there was this like, everything was experiential and technology's kind of reviews that you know <laughs> getting a record was it new music tuesdays right like that's that was the thing you was like oh this is you, you'd get and i realized buying multiple cds at the same time was a bad idea yeah because whatever one i opened first was on repeat until the yeah. next set of things it's like, like buying a lot of clothes at the same time yeah i'm like where like you know, like wear one pair of jeans yeah I'm like what is this yeah of all these things yeah well the thing i keep thinking about because of what my wife had, had told me 
And I started using it teaching haircut. Like, hey, if I asked you why something, not to challenge you, is I want you to be engaging with that part of your brain because I'm not going to be here to give you the answer, right? Uh, whatever it may be. But it's directly translated into um, parenting. Yeah, probably. Dad, now, why is the, uh, like, how is, how is cheese made? Well, what do you think cheese is made out? Well, it's made from tax. Okay, well, how do you, I don't know. Well, what could it get? They're, like, they're giving out all these crazy answers. Like they put the, the milk and it goes in the rock and shit. And then the rock shit comes back down and now we have cheese or whatever it is. And string cheese is made differently than the square cheese. You know, my kids are six and four. Yeah. And I'm not going to, that's wrong. That's wrong. I don't want them. I don't want them to hear that song. I want them to hear. I want their brains to go. Yeah. Because they don't recognize limitations because they're not also, they're not embarrassed. There's no level of like pretension. You know, they're just going to say, well, it goes in a rocket ship dad, to the cheese factory on the ah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Today, my son, I was like, Tab, my, my son, his name's Tab. He's a third. I'm a junior, right? And I was like, Tab, where's your, um, why don't you have pants on? I don't want to wear it. Good enough for me. Yeah. All right. So you're wearing around in your underwear and a t-shirt. That's fine. Asked and answered. All right. There you go. I, I got it. So this is kind of like air dried. I like so it. Man. One of the things, um, I don't know if you've ever had it done is I went with a razor. Yeah. And so what it does is it softens the edges. See, so because you, your hair is so thick. Well, thank you. I know. You get that thick hair. And you have those talons, right? Yeah. So the more blunt lines you create, the more clunky it looks at the same style perfectly. Oh, so like, knowing that and knowing that you have a lifestyle where you're active, you're going, you're you're wrestling, you're working out, yeah. you're probably wanting to make, you want to look as good, but probably don't want to spend a lot of time. I've never had a client come in and say, you know what? Um, I want to spend 40 minutes just staring at myself in the mirror, doing hair. You never cut any of those like uh, glam core kids hair? Because sure seems like they really enjoyed spending two hours getting their hair. Well, the shit. sort of. I never had that. So what happened? So this is a true story. So I ended up cut. Uh, uh, the first band I worked with was Slipknot. Mm -hmm. So I was like 22 cutting Jim from Slipknot, right? And Jim and I still talk. He actually was giving me advice about pickups like two weeks ago. Uh, um, good big fella. Oh, and big fellas. Talk about running the gamut tonight from Joey to, 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 to Jim, right? There's this band, they, uh, I, I, his, uh, John, his name's John, and he was the bass player for a band called From First to Last. Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, Skrillex's band. Yeah, yeah. So I did, like, their music videos, I did their hair for the photo shoots, and, like, that was about as close as I got into that, like, hardcore post- punk metal scene or whatever. Like, I call it the Vans Warped Work. Yeah, the Warped Work Kids. Warped Work Kids, yeah. And then from there, that's when I met like uh, Brett Guritz from mm -hmm. Bad Religion. And then I would cut, I started cutting his hair. And then he, they would hire me to make over some of the bands. So Escape the Fate, I did their their stuff. And that's when I became friends with Ronnie Radke. Yeah, Fallen in Reverse. And I've, died, I've been doing his hair since I was like 23 or something. I like Ronnie a lot. I think he's a yeah. really misunderstood dude. I, I like Ronnie. I think when you're so focused at like getting a second chance at life. Yeah. You have a different level of intensity of living. You know, like the uh, who's a kid from uh, Attila too, the front man, um, Franz, uh, Franzilla. Like there, when you look, if you're going to spend time being an edge lord, you have to understand that there's going to be some pushback, right? If you're going to purposefully yeah. do offensive or controversial things, there's a territory you're going into that, yeah, you know, there's going to be some fallout, you know. But yeah, so I never really got into the the scene thing. It was just sort of randomly through the band yeah you know uh and so people are like, oh you love doing wild crazy hair and i was like no, i just want them to look yeah. and their image is that and i want them to look their best in that that world yeah. you know shit man i feel like we could talk for hours um yeah so here's your hair i'm gonna blow dry cool and then style what kind of product do you put in here something non uh shiny anything like more of a pasty as opposed to like a gel or right so you so you like make to not look shiny yeah, just because I it, t it tends to sometimes, and then people I look very uh, Guido, you know. Can we still say that word? Is that no. this is a, here's a <laughs> that's, no, here's the thing I the, the the Cuomo fella he said I, mean, he, I don't know if it was Guido, but it was something, and it wasn't like an extreme derogatory. It was like uh, oh no, it's Fredo. He called him Fredo, like yeah. the top of it. and he's like you understand that's like the N word to Italians. I was like wait a second. No, it's not. I'm like, I, that's I, a ridiculous thing to say. I, I, I thought there was another word that they got offended about. They'd be called each other the Sopranos. 
uh, I don't even want to say it. Guinness, Guinness, you can say it. That's not me. I'm supposed to. Yeah, but it's the same. I, I hear it. When I live in North Jersey, like, dudes would say, like, yeah, we be like, he's a, oh, he just said, he's some white trash idiot. That's the way it was still sold to be. Like, it, you know what, what what white trash would be to a non trashing white guy? That's what it, that's what is. Oh, true. I get it? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. But, um, I say we, let's just hold on to terms we can say before it's totally a matter of time, right? I can't even keep track about what is politically correct these days. Yeah. I, I think in my head, I'm still living in the Beavis and Butthead era. You know, the bringing it back, right? Yeah. My buddy, um, got contacted by them. Yeah. I can't figure to use his video. Oh, that's off the four. Yeah, it's like his dream come true. No, Mike Judge is like an absolute. He lives here. Here, yeah, he does. Yeah, he's an Austin guy. Absolute hero. I mean, I love, that's what I, you know, I, did, I got to that point in my career was like, you know, I had blah, blah, and I had, just, but, you know, it's not like I was selling, it's not 1989 anymore where you could just like retire with radio money. It used to be that way. It's like, you can get up a few careers to go now. It's really tough. So I knew I was like, I have to make some transition. I'll work for the self art guys. I'll write comedy with Chappelle. Yeah. And it turns out, I was like, no, cause I, you know, and I'm not clowning and I'm not going to get uh, pissy about it. Cause this Lord knows I was like super fortunate, but like I was asked to be on Dancing to the start that I was asked to host like access Hollywood. Those and like those jobs were coming my way. And you like it, man. You took, I took it, I took it for a while and it was certainly, they pay you way too much money considering how much effort I put in. Um, but you, I was also like, I couldn't do it. And I would tell them, I was like, I can do this and I will never phone it in, but you're going to find someone better because there's someone out there who would love to do this job. Your right. angst wasn't there. So what is your passion right now? You want to like to be dead serious? I don't know. I can't narrow it down to perfect. Okay. Whether it's being like uh, a silly, uh, making silly records, or getting into animation, or uh, writing on a on a on a live action show, whatever it is, is like when you ask your kids how how is cheese made, and they answer that, mm -hmm. I want that world to be alive somewhere for it. I have no desire to try to. To try to solve the world's problems, nor do I think I'm capable. What I do think is like, if you want to just indulge yeah. to that weird world where people don't take things seriously. The other day I spent, I'm not exaggerating. Okay, this is not exact. I spent three, four hours yeah, trying to get to the bottom of what I heard on the Breakfast Club because he tells jo he tells Judd Nelson, if I have to come back here. Again, I'm going to drag your dick in the dirt. And I spent like three hours just sitting by myself in quiet thinking. I was like, are you going to remove his dick? Or are you going to like drag his pelvis? Like first, you're going to have to get him naked. And he's in high school. That's gnarly. And I, I just, if I could get paid to have those conversations where like, again, I have, I have no idea whether or not the vaccine's good for you. I have no idea whether or not uh, the Ukraine situation is uh, a, a value to on a global scale, but I will talk to you all day about wanting to lay a silent fart because you're on a date and it's not silent. And that moment where you're like, fuck, I really fucked this up because I certainly have been there. Is that what you're more or less doing with your podcast? Yeah. I, just, I mean, look, the, the, the fitness industry and it's certainly the digital kind of the, the fitness podcast and YouTube channel is a very overly saturated industry but i just wanted a place where you could feel like really comfortable even if you're an abject beginner going and listening and getting information and not feel intimidated by like kind of the bro culture of it you know? i was absolutely intimidated by bro culture yeah because i was never those people are yeah i was never your you know your athlete growing up in school right i was like your skinny long-haired heavy metal guy yeah doesn't really work with the jock right thing so, yeah. for sure yeah they used to not work. Then at that time, like growing up, because I went to high school out in Temecula, right? Yeah. So like everybody was more into that, like, um, you know, because Blink-182 is just down the street. They're in Powell. Yeah. So everybody's into like Lab Wagon and Blink-182 and uh, Real of Biscuits and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And all that pop pump. And all the, the, the jocks are into the poppy stuff, bleaching their hair white, you know, with their Arnett sunglasses and their black flies. I'm like, if I go to the gym 
if I ever weep for once, I'm going to run into those guys again. Yeah. Even like super hipster dude that you meet or hipster chick where she tries to pretend like, oh, well, time in the gym and, and eating right, that's so, that's so not cool. And I'm all about like anti-culture and fine. Yeah. In reality, most human beings, if they had the opportunity, would like to know how they can look and feel better. I don't understand how we can argue that, right? But a lot of people, especially like executives or like really well-to-do people who have really, really, really worked hard and accomplished things, they like to pretend like it's not important to them, but then in secret, they're like, but seriously, like how can I lose? What if you could remove that, yeah, that kind of taboo that came with everyone who lifts weights is like this monster meathead guy? Uh, which is, by the way, another kind of insane misnomer because most like genuine meatheads are like really intellectual people. In, in, in my experience, they're, you know, it's it's the same thing. Like when I would meet with, I would ever encounter people who um, were in at some point an ex service member and mm-hmm. find out they're like a Green Beret yeah. or a Navy SEAL or Special Forces. And not only are they just physically top peak. Yeah. They're also mentally there too. And, and again, it's just like, oh, look at those, 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 you know, crazy army people. But it was like, no, there, there's, there's a lot more. And that's an interesting point. I, I'm glad you, that's a great analogy too, because I always say like, whether it be surfers or, or fighters or, uh, you know, bodybuilders, people have this idea, like they may be done. But if you look most of the time, that's not true. Okay. And I think the common theme is that like they're voluntarily, because this isn't 1968. Like if you're in the military, it's a voluntary deal. Absolutely. You're volunteering to do something really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Like going to the gym, no judge is forcing you to go to the gym. I mean, like, no. You know, and so getting getting really ripped is like really difficult. You're volunteering yourself to go do something really difficult. I think that says something about a person. With fitness and diet, I just want to ask you this before like we're done, because we're we're pretty much done unless you want you look and I honestly my hair looks fantastic. My wife's gonna be so happy. Sweet. <laughs> um if is every time you you smile, there's something about John Stamos I just think about. I just listen. I've been watching a lot of Full House with my kids. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man, if you ever want to grow your hair out, there's this one season, yeah. John Stamos. I was like, you could pull it off. Thank you. Think about that. I, I have a great John Stamos story. Mm-hmm. Hang on. I want to hear it, but I want to ask. I want, yeah. You can tell the story. Yeah. I want you to tell the story. Um, but I want to ask you this. If there's any health or food advice that you feel like universally would help someone who's like, I don't know where to start. Yeah. How'd it be? The hard part is, is like, there's... Are we talking, it's so hard because it runs a gamut. There's people who genuinely have no concept what is a carbohydrate, what is protein, yeah, and and where that, that a person, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. I would say Mark's Daily Apple, Mark Sisson, does a great job of making things really interesting for a guy like me and also could be completely understood by, so like the Primal Blueprint, Mark Sisson, S-I-S-S-O-N. Okay. He's in his 70s, just really, really. That's a great book. And it, it, all, anything he puts out, his website is Mark's Daily Apple. Mark's Daily Apple. And I think it can really get to the bottom of it. It's like, listen, fruits, vegetables, like lean proteins and regulate how much upping your protein. It's not just for meatheads. It's really a good idea for all the cells in your body. You know, just kind of really basic stuff that's going to absolutely get you going in the right direction. I just think that that's like the thing that never nobody ever talks about. They always get so niche and they get so over the top where I think it becomes overwhelming before you begin. Yeah. Here's something that the, and every expert I've ever had the luxury of talking to man, woman, old, young, all agree on this is that there is a gross over uh, estimation of how much work you have to put in to have like a movie star body. Yeah. And now it's a, an extreme level of consistency. Uh, we were talking about at the beginning of, of this podcast is the extreme level of commitment. But it's not as much work as people. They're like, people all the time, they're like, how old do you do that? I was like, 44. Like, you must spend hours in the gym. I was like, no, I spend about three hours a week in the gym. I spend about three, three and a half hours a week in the gym. Yeah. Granted, I'm doing, I'm really active outside, but I was like, it does not take that much actual work work if mm-hmm. you're smart about it. And uh, it just, it's just something you, you do for decades. You're John Stanley store. So this is, I'm at, <laughs> I'm at, there's a big K-Rock festival yeah. show called the, uh, acoustic Christmas, almost acoustic Christmas. Yeah. yeah. And so we have like our big summer one. This is like winter. Okay. I'm like 23 years old. 
uh, and John Stamos is backstage. John Stamos is a very nice man, from what I understand. And he's Uncle Thor. He's friends with like almost exclusively like comics and and funny people. So that always said something good about a guy. He's like, yeah, he's not like he didn't bring his like manager to the show. Like, he was friends with he was like friends with Kimball and those. And so those, that crew, the Kimball and like his writers and Corolla are all there, and they come up to me and they're like, hey. Um, we have a really funny idea. And I was like, you got to remember, I'm really young and I'm also like not seasoned in the mm-hmm. funny business, you know? So I'm like, okay, whatever you want. Like they yeah. could have told me, eat a handful of your own feces. I would be like, yes, sir. <laughs> and then like go up to John Samos and, and but don't be like, I don't want anything from me, but to like play it real natural and tell him that you're his son from like a, like a one night stand. And you're like, you don't, I don't want to pressure you in any way. I just, I never thought I'd meet you, sir. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm actually... Uh, I'm actually your son. Because you got to remember, like, I was, it, he was probably, he was probably my age at the time. Yeah. And I was 20, early 20. Totally. And then I was like, okay. And he go up and uh, I was like, Mr. Stamos. And he's like, oh, I'm going to And I was like, listen, I don't want anything from you. Uh, but I just want to let you know, um, I'm actually, I'm actually your son from a one night stand. And he looks around. He's like, what? He's like, what's your mom's name? And I was like, uh, Red. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's what I thought. And he turned and he looked at and then you see Kimmel like laughing and he's like, you fuckers. He just pointed. I was like, yeah. And they're like, you really shit the bed. I was like, I know, I'm sorry. I mean, what do you want from me? I love, I'd love the opportunity to try that again at my age now, but then it won't work. Yeah, but still, it, the age at the time could have, oh, it would have been perfect if he, if he just, I not. fully could be a son at, you know, at that age. Well, dude, uh, if you want, let's do this again. I would love to. If you're cool with it, I mean, I want to talk more about the fitness saying. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime in, anytime in your personal life too. Just give me a read. I'm all yeah. I'm happy. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, see you.